Hello again, my name is Sophie Dove. Previously, I gave you the lecture on nutrients. My plan today is to introduce you to a few classic types of experimental designs that are associated with identifying the influence of a factor on a given response, either as part of a field study or associated with a manipulative experiment. I will begin by introducing you to a few key terms and concepts. Why do we conduct experiments? Typically, because we want to precisely and accurately answer some specific question or questions. The answer usually involves observing the impact of a treatment on a group or collection of subjects. Prior to engaging in any experiment, it is important to identify known or expected sources of variability, as this will improve precision and minimise bias. Professor Hergelberg spoke about precision in his field methods lecture, but it is clear that bias has to be eliminated if the answers obtained to questions are to overlap with the correct or true answers, the truth. The following schematic is intended to help you understand these terms and their relationship to each other. Observations are precise and accurate if they are closely clustered and overlap the truth. Observations are inaccurate but precise if they are closely clustered but don't approximate the truth. They can be accurate and imprecise when they overlap the truth but are not closely clustered. And they can be both inaccurate and imprecise. Clearly, a key goal must be to eliminate bias and improve precision. A step essential to this goal is to ensure that background conditions are uniform across all the treatments applied to all the experimental subjects. Talk of treatment requires the introduction of a few more technical terms. A factor is essentially a category or type of treatment. Sometimes they are referred to as controlled independent variables or categorical variables. Here, the application or presence of nutrients is given as an example of a factor. Factors have levels, that is, the different amounts of the factor that you are going to dose the experimental subjects with. In this case, there are three levels, low, mid, high concentrations of nutrients. Experimental designs can include more than one factor. Therefore, the design of the experiment may be referred to as a one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, and so on experiment. A factor is fixed when the levels under study are the only levels of interest. A factor is random when the levels under study are a random sample from a larger population. And the goal of the study is to make a statement regarding the larger population. Another way of understanding this is that if the level studied divided by the levels of interest is equal to 1, then the factor is fixed. If it is less than 1, then the factor is random. Typically, the sex of an animal will be a fixed factor. The levels studied are male and female, and for the most part, these are the only levels available. Whilst the genotype of an animal will be a random factor, you might select to examine four genotypes from a population that may include thousands of distinct genotypes. If you recall, Professor Hergelberg suggested that you add replica experimental areas to the, augment the level of replication in your experiment, and hence improve your ability to associate responses with the different treatments as opposed to mere sites, differences irrespective of the treatment. 
For such an experimental design, the question is, are polluted sites different from non-polluted control sites? And the hypothesis would be, polluted and controlled means for a specific response variable are different. A description of the experimental design would be given as follows. This is a one factorial design where the factor is habitat studied at two levels, polluted and control, with three replicate measurements determined for each level of the factor. The factor is fixed because there are only two levels of interest for the factor, as we are not concerned with different amounts of pollution in the present question, just presence and absence of pollution. An alternative and commonly used approach that requires slightly more work includes replicated transits within each experimental area. In this case, the question is slightly more complex and asks, are the sites within a habitat more similar to each other than the sites between habitats? We can compare amongst experimental areas because we have more than a single transect for each area. The hypothesis is then that the response variable, for example, abundance of sea cucumbers, will vary between habitats and that differences will be greater than differences observed on a smaller spatial scale. It is a two factorial nested experimental design. The first factor is habitat with two levels, polluted and controlled as before. We now, however, have a second factor, site, with three separate levels or locations. Habitat is fixed as before, but site is random because there are more than three locations we could have selected from for each habitat level. The nested approach is necessary because the same site cannot be used for both polluted and controlled habitats. Again, this is a nested design because not all the boxes can be filled with data when we tabulate the responses observed. For example, site 1 cannot be found both in the control habitat and in the polluted habitat, as a site cannot be both polluted and clean at the same time. When we select sites amongst possible options, it is important that we check that any differences obtained isolate our specific question from other background conditions that may lead to our obtaining significant differences that actually have nothing to do with our specific question. River plumes extend into significant portions of the Great Barrier Reef following large rainfall. A question that we might like to ask then is, do the river plumes affect the distribution and abundance of benthic coral reef organisms? To assist with this aim, we might like to download satellite image data that determines where the plumes extended to within the Great Barrier Reef. Logically, the inshore, because it is closer to the mouth of rivers, is likely to be more affected than the offshore. But if you select inshore reefs as plume affected and offshore reefs as not, it is possible that non-plume effects drive any outcomes observed. For example, upwelling and cooler water may affect the offshore as opposed to the inshore reefs. Likewise, if you select your plume affected sites from just the northern regions and your plume unaffected sites from just the southern regions, Again, these distinct latitudinal regions come with long-term differences in temperature profiles. As much as possible, you need to select sites that eliminate these confounding background features. Here, I hope to find satellite images that would show the plume extending to the red sites, but not to the yellow sites. However, this may not always be possible. Furthermore, your interest in river plumes may be tied to the effects of either nutrients or salinity or sediment or pesticide concentrations on the subject. 
However, it may not be possible to find sites in the field that isolate these different drivers, but otherwise have similar background features. This is where manipulative experiments come into their own. This brings us to the end of part one of this lecture. In part two, we will begin to take a look at a design that is often used in manipulative experiments to tease apart the roles of different drivers or factors. Thank you.